Okay, we're going to start in one minute. Let, just give me the signal when you want me to press the button. Yep, will do. And if the MEP joins, just, just let her in. Okay, whenever you're ready, let's go. In three two, one, live. So, good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to this Eurofair Engage event, the first in a series of conversations about topics related to the steel industry. And today we're going to be focusing on the Circular Economy Action Plan from proposal to reality. My name is Jackie Davis. I will have the privilege of moderating a totally interactive debate uh, after a short presentation to set some context for our discussion. A uh, bit of housekeeping before we start. As I said, it will be a totally interactive debate with some questions from me to our distinguished panel and later on, I hope, also from all of you. This is how you join the conversation. You are all muted for now. If if you want to write your question, please click on the Q&A button, not the chat button, the Q&A button, and write your question. And could I ask you please to be brief and to the point so I can see easily what your question is and who it's for. Twitter length or less would be great. Uh, if you want to speak, uh, click on the raised hands button. Uh, and then when the time comes, I will allow you to talk and ask you to uh, open your mic. I won't ask you to put on your camera, so don't worry if you're watching us in your pajamas, we're not going to know. Um, if you have a technical issue, you can use the chat box. You can't see us, you can't hear us. If you use the chat box for that, uh, we will try to help you. Uh, if you are watching us via YouTube uh, and you want to uh, comment or question, put a question, you can do so in the box on YouTube. We're monitoring that and those will be relayed to me. Last one, if you are wanting to communicate what you're hearing here with the outside world, please use the Twitter hag Circular Economy. And finally, we have interpretation today, uh, English and Italian. Uh, if you want to listen in a particular uh, language, then click on the globe at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a little globe on the right hand side. Click on that, select your language and you will hear the entire event in the language of your choice. Uh, we have that because uh, we are hoping to be joined by an Italian MEP. Uh, so um, that's where it is if you need it. So as I said earlier, we're gonna start with a short uh, presentation just to set the context for our discussion uh, and then I will introduce our panel and we will launch the debate. Uh, so I'm delighted now uh, to give the floor to Aurelio Bracconi who is Senior Manager of Raw Materials of the Circular Economy at Eurofair and he's going to talk about the Circular Economy Action Plan and the example of steel. So Aurelio, uh, thank you very much for having us today uh, and over to you, and I think you have some slides, so let's okay. get those Phew. set up. Uh, and then, as I say, after a while Aurelio is setting up his slide, um, please do keep those questions coming in right from the beginning. Uh, don't wait until I announce a QA. and uh, I will feed them into the discussion as we go along. So I think we're almost there we are, perfect. Aurelio, over to you. Many thanks. So good morning, everyone. I prepare a few introductory slides for uh, starting this event. Uh, in principle, when I mean, they are focusing on a circular economy, but we know that is, I mean, is, a, is a, an action plan uh, that will support uh, low carbon sustainable transition to also transform the Europe in a resource efficient economy. And in particular, I would uh, 
cover four aspects that for us are really, really important. The one of is this sector that we think that are also important to have a super economy that will turn effective and uh, will uh, haze this scope, the final goal. Uh, we talk about uh, raw materials, sustainable products, industrial synergies and chemicals policy. Let's start with the raw material, just an introduction. So, I mean, what is important to say at the moment is that, I mean, the modern society needs steel. I mean, steel is a versatile material that is ubiquitous in our economy. 90% uh, of produced steel is uh, still in use today. And however, on top of this is also the most recycled material in the world. I shouldn't say this, everyone knows, but it is a permanent material that means that can be recycled again and again. And the, the magic of this is because we use two resources, primary and secondary, suitably mixed in a way that make the products very versatile and applicable for a lot of examples that you see in my slide below. below. But the point is that every steel we produce at the moment contains ferro scrap lowest part, highest part, but this in order to ace performances. And also steel is an enabler, enabling material, because we can talk about windmill, because steel is the backbone of a windmill. But it's also important to say, as I put as an example, so turbines, the most modern turbines are steel intensive and they can cut greenhouse gas emissions of 40%. So the, the magic is that we mix both material at the best. Then of course, it is not time yet, in our opinion, to, to say that we should just have one material secondary instead of, of primary. The point is that we need to, both, to have both the same time available because now that we are in transforming conditions, so we, are, we, we start our transformation and we need to understand how to use both at the best. The second aspect that I want to, to, to touch on raw materials is secondary raw materials. This is an example of the steel cycle in Europe, in which we mix primary, secondary. The point is that in order to have this magic steel cycle happening, we need to have a very well-functioning, I would say, part of the waste management in Europe. That means that we should have a very good collection, treatment of material to have create the condition to improve the quality of the secondary raw material in order to make the secondary raw material fit for more and more demanding applications. In circular terms, it makes really sense to recycle steel in Europe. That's why that we said we want to have fair trade in general and we don't like to have an actual ban, but ferro scrap and secondary raw material in general are, uh, contribute to our strategy on the circular economy and low carbon transition. That means that the material should be processed in a way uh, that it is recycled the highest possible standards. Otherwise, this will not be functional. And if preferable, uh, should be processed if possible in Europe. Then the, the third, the second point that I would like to touch is the sustainable process policy. And I would like to start from far from this. It is important because, uh, I mean, the commission started a really long journey. And for me, the most important thing is that we need to communicate to the consumers and to the society what is relevant of all materials we use. And we need to transparently also aware the best performance of the material. And you see, you have many options here. I buy a new one, I repair my old one, I just use a phone that I can dismantle or just change every two years. That's the, the consumer choice that is a, a, a part that is really built on uh, trade-offs. But the trade-offs have to be controlled and they have to be reduced in a way that we just work for our goals. That is to create a market with a circular product and we enforce also the transition in the consumer habits. That's why the commission started with this uh, uh, sustainable products policy initiative that is very good. But if you read it, there are plenty of criteria in the, the document just to say, well, how to design sustainable products. You see, there, I put a big board just to present them. It's, it's a lot, it's complicated. 
But we think that there are, it is important to be clear that we should have few guiding principles that should be, in our view, ubiquitous in all the, 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 the strands of European products policy. The first one is a life cycle assessment. So it's a buzzword. Everyone talks about LCA. What we want to have is that LCA is good, should be, however, robust, science based we know that there is path going around. What we, what we want to support is that we should have decision making based on our cycle assessment, and we should take what there is of good from path. For instance, data quality, possibility to use only certain robust impact, circular footprint formula to have into account recyclability of products, but also their, their, their possibility to, in, to in, embed secondary raw materials. Principles, that doesn't mean the same rule applied, for instance, uh, I don't know, um, single use to all products. But principle is saying that, I mean, checking recyclability of products should be always in, should be an agreed principle. Few, but very important, that will work as a, a guiding light in this long process. For us, recyclability is essential. But because, okay, we are recyclable, everyone knows. We recycle scrap, everyone knows. But recyclability, it is in our view, a very strong uh, factor that allows to reduce trade-offs, for instance, when you have a product that you imagine that is durable, but then you have to face it with the, result, the energy efficiency. What you will do, then your recyclability makes a bridge. And for us, this is an essential principle it should always be in. And the last one is eco design. Eco design is a very, I mean, complex legislation, but is 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 important because it, it acts directly into the on the market. Then eco design should take on board all these guiding principles. A very good LCA, the path quality data, recyclability, in order to uh, facilitate the transition. Another point that I want to touch really briefly, I know is a lot of thing, but things, but uh, it's uh, industrial uh, synergies. Steel sector doesn't mean steel only. Well, we we have we fatally generate many other materials. Well. Ferrous like mill scale, uh, dust, uh, even heat from our, so a lot. And uh, when possible, when feasible, we exchange all of them with other industrial sectors. What we felt from the past policy is that maybe we need here to have a sort of breakthrough approach on this. Because so we are talking about materials that are exchanged among sectors for the mutual satisfactory, I would say, business in the way. That is a circular, is economic, then is a circular economy. Okay, I will we'll have to ask you to be very brief now. Sorry, we are no, trying to the, the, last, the last slide, that is, uh, that is uh, the last point that I want to touch is chemicals. When we have chemicals legislation, it's very a priority on the agenda of, of uh, the European Commission. Our point is that the chemicals, chemicals policy should be dealt with care in circular economy, because there is a lot of non-toxic hazardous. The main point is a lot of uh, materials that are hazardous in theory, then are applied in many applications that fulfills the most stringent standards. Spoons, scalpels, even implants, they contain cobalt, for instance. Do we have alternatives for this? At the moment, maybe he, I put a, probably a, a wood spoon or a scalpel with wood that know it fulfill the, the medical device directive or for implants, honestly, I don't know. So then that means that this approach, just say, just take it out without considering risk and real, real risk for health safety. It is really a winning one. Taking into account that cobalt, nickel and chromium in this material are the circular enablers. I, Jackie, sorry, I'm always talking too much, I know. No, 
Thank you very much, Aurelia. And it's important to get the context, but uh, I do want to have a chance to discuss uh, with our panel. Um, uh, just to say that if you have any questions for Aurelio, uh, he will be uh, listening to us in the background and can jump in and answer them later on. So please remember, put them in the Q&A box or raise your hand if you want. Now to. I have to stop share and to close the video. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much indeed. So let me introduce our panel and get our conversation underway. Joining me to discuss building a real circular economy in Europe are Maria Rincon Yevana, team leader, circular economy, sustainable production, products and consumption in the Directorate General for the Environment in the European Commission. Good morning, Maria. Uh, please do activate your camera and mic now. Also uh, delighted to welcome Stefan Arditi, Director of Policy Integration and and circular economy at the European Environmental Bureau. Great to have you with us, Stefan. Uh, please again, activate your camera now. Uh, delighted to also welcome Eva Blitz, research manager at Jan Kontoret, the Swedish Steel Industry Association, uh, and Axel Eggert, director general at Eurofair. Uh, I should mention that we were, as you will have known from the program, due to be joined by Patricia Toya, MEP. Unfortunately, she was called away at the last moment and I have now received a message since we started the webcast. She had hoped to join us during the discussion, but she won't be able to. Uh, so, but let's dive straight in. Uh, and Maria, let me come to you first, um, because Aurelio there was outlining both the role as he sees it of steel in the circular economy and some of the challenges, some of the issues uh, that he believes need to be addressed. From your perspective, how do you see the role of steel and, and what, what do you make of the challenges as outlined by him? Hello, Jackie, thank you. Um, well, I mean, he made uh, very valid points in, in his presentation and I, I imagine we will touch upon them in the discussion, but if I have to take a contribution that in my view is key, it's the contribution of the steel uh, sector to the reduction of CO2 emissions when applying circular economy practices. And we see more and more that the circular economy can offer a contribution to achieve the climate neutrality objective set out in the European Green Deal by 20. 2050. So I would say that they have uh, a key role in making it possible. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to how to make sure they can play that role uh, in our discussion. But Stefan, from your perspective, um, the role of steel, what for you, uh, from an NGO perspective, looking at this, what are the challenges for the industry and for policymakers here? Thank you, Jackie. Uh, good morning, all. So for uh, DB, I would see four main challenges uh, a bit to kick off the kickstart the discussion. First is really about decarbonizing the manufacturing processes, including increasing further the uptake of high quality recycled steel in Europe. Second is really work toward enhanced reuse of steel, uh, because uh, in the initial presentation, it's clear that there has been uh, uh, emphasis on recyclability, but I think we need to think a bit beyond recycling and recyclability and what does that mean to be able to reuse steel? So, and uh, uh, in building notably, but also in other manufacturing sectors, what type of architecture system, disassembly for uh, reuse uh, we can uh, consider and including for packaging sector. I mean, for me, it's still crazy that when there is a steel packaging, we just do not um, grasp the potential of reuse of this uh, steel packaging and we immediately bin it and recycle it. The third one is really about systematizing the industrial symbiosis. I think it's been uh, very clearly presented in the initial presentation and notably the recovery of wasted heat, because that's uh, uh, purely waste. And fourth one is about sustainable sourcing, both of primary and secondary raw material with a, a new due diligence requirements so that we can really differentiate sustainable procurement and sourcing from, uh, I would say, uh, not so sustainable sourcing. Thank you very much. All issues I'd like to come back to uh, in a little while, but let's continue to build our pitch here. Eva Blitz, from your perspective, um, Obviously, I mean, I'm sure you agree on the role of steel and, and Aurelio has outlined that very clearly, but for you, the most important challenges. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for inviting me and good morning to all. No, I, I want to, to, to build a little bit about the, the, the part of decarbonization that was mentioned by both uh, Stefan and Maria. I mean, there is a role, of course, to play on, on the product and the recyclability of the steel products, but also you were mentioning the process on processing steel. So, and, I, and today I'm having my Swedish hat on, so I can happily talk about the Swedish steel industry and the transformation that we have started for four years about changing the steel process. Uh, and we are talking here about the steel process on doing on primary raw material, ma mainly primary raw material, SSAB and hybrid is based on the primary raw material route. So we are changing from blast furnace to doing on, 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 on iron sponge and doing it on, on, on uh, without any CO2 emissions. And that's really important. Why are we doing this? Because we need quite a lot of new steel. There is an increased demand on more steel when people is coming out of poverty in the, in the whole society. I mean, we're talking about the UN Global Goals. They will be needed for more steel. And I do agree we can reuse, we can recycle, but there isn't enough of steel. So we need to do also the primary route. And, and, and I am getting a little bit worried with this, uh, the principles or the, the, the requirements of this recycled content. So if you put the absolute requirement on recycled content on the new processes that will come for hybrid, maybe we are harming that type of steel with these requirements. So my key message is that we really need to dig to the details. Different material sectors need different type of tools. Because what if we have a green procurement saying it's needed to be recycled content and SSAB and hybrid is not possible to buy? We yeah. need to create the market. So that's, I, I will stop there, just to make it a little bit more complicated. And, yeah, and no, absolutely. More and I would like to get a reaction to that uh, from our panel, very much echoing what Aurelio said. This is, he said, not the time to say we need a, a fixed binding limit. Uh, we need both, that's absolutely crucial. We'll talk also, I hope, about this point about increasing the uptake uh, of high quality recycled steel. So we have two issues here. We have, how do we make sure there is enough of it to meet the need? We can't at the moment. And then how do we increase the uptake? Axel, uh, your opening thoughts, complete the picture for us in terms of the challenge. Yeah, thank you very much, Jackie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you had two questions, the role uh, of steel in the transition and the key challenges. Uh, I tried to sum this up uh, from the Eurofair perspective. Uh, we have heard from Aurelio, basically steel is indeed the backbone for many solutions uh, of the green transition. Uh, one key example uh, is a wind power mill, which is uh, today made uh, of uh, steel uh, in terms of 85% uh, of the material use. Uh, and uh, often uh, this steel cannot be replaced by, by other multi, uh, materials. There is no alternative. For example, offshore windmill towers, uh, there is actually no alternative uh, to steel. Uh, the turbines, there is no alternative to steel. Uh, so steel is uh, at the basis uh, for the green uh, transition, uh, for the sustainable circular economy. And of course, we also know that um, we also still have to go away as a steel industry uh, to become more circular, to, to become more sustainable as well. That's uh, for sure. Uh, so without steel, the circular economy is not possible. Uh, that is what, what we believe. Um, there are no alternatives with similar properties and recyclability. Uh, and uh, before uh, the end of this century, uh, we believe we may have uh, sufficient steel scrap in the world, and I'm talking in the world, for a continuous loop. Um, so there are some decades to go uh, until we are there. Uh, so there are a few other major materials which uh, may achieve a similar uh, grade of circularity, and that's mainly metals. Uh, most other materials do not have this, this possibility. Um, we are currently working on a definition for green steel because we want, our companies want to commercialize green steel. Um, but of course the framework conditions need to be set. Uh, we will start, uh, when we're talking about green steel, we will start actually with a CO2 low steel as a first step because you cannot do everything at the same time. Uh, that would be impossible to manage. Um, so, um, 
uh, this will take into account, uh, for example, the product environment footprint approach, which the commission is working on, uh, but uh, we need not to have it too complex as a starting point. Uh, we can evolve this uh, in, in the process. The, the key challenges, or uh, let me just add uh, one point on the decarbonization, because this has been made by both Maria from the commission and Stefan from the EEB. Um, we are the only uh, energy intensive uh, sector which has set out an ambition to decrease our emissions by 30% by 2030 um, if the right framework condition, and that means the level playing field, are, are set uh, by the regulator. Uh, and when we are talking about 30%, the reference year for that is 2018. If we compare this with 1990 levels, we uh, have the ambition to uh, reduce 55% of our emissions by 2030. But again, we need uh, a level playing field and to create a market for green, green products. Absolutely, uh, and that creation of the market, something I'd like to come back to. But um, can I, just to mention, ladies and gentlemen, that um, Maria can only stay with us for half an hour. So if you have questions for her, please do begin to write them already into the Q&A box uh, so that I can put to her before she has to leave us. But Maria, can I come back, first of all, to the Sustainable Products Policy Initiative? Uh, because Aurelio said, and it's been underlined also uh, by Axel and by the others, the importance here of, of having, he said, we've got a lot, it's a good initiative, but he said, we need just a few guiding principles. And he enumerated for him, it's life cycle analysis, aligned principles, recyclability, eco design, but not delving down into too much detail because sector by sector, it will be different. And, and Eva's already given us an example of where it's different in terms of recycled content. What's your reaction to that? Do you think there is a risk of over prescribing in this policy? Uh, no, because uh, how uh, we are seeing this process is uh, a two step approach. We will be setting these sustainability principles and the action plan is clear that the commission will look into them and as well product requirements, uh, horizontal ones. And then uh, what we could expect is that uh, this uh, horizontal uh, legislation will be implemented product by product category somehow in a way similar to what is happening right now with the co-design uh, directive. Of course, this uh, we are investigating all possible options and what are the options that are most suitable and, and, and more appropriate and, and the trade-offs between uh, acting or not, or not acting and the subsidiarity principle. As you know, the, 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 the commission expects to deliver this uh, legislative proposal by the end of the year. So we are conducting all sorts of studies and impact assessment. The only thing that I can encourage the, the, the steel sector is to contribute to the process. So all, all inputs are, uh, are received. And for that, uh, the, the public consultation uh, for this initiative will be launched in a couple of weeks. I uh, will remain open for, for 12 weeks. And, and uh, the, the flow of inputs needs to continue to continue taking place. But uh, yes, how we see this is our, this our luck. And just if I could follow up on that, this point about um, setting uh, targets or, or a binding limit uh, for you know, how much uh, primary raw material, how much recycled content. Uh, just a reaction, if you would, to Eva's point about um, we can't, there isn't enough uh, scrap, that we can't do it necessarily and you need to be very careful. Um, how will you take account of that? Well, we need to act on supply and demand. So we need to act on demand, meaning we will need to explore what are the, the limits on, on recycled content, which products uh, will this be done through uh, these horizontal measures, will be done through a specific uh, legislation. For instance, the construction product regulation is being reviewed, the industrial emissions uh, directive as well. So uh, packaging as well. So there's this ongoing, but also we need to act on supply. And, and for that, we need to support recycling capacities in, in, in Europe. So so we are able to recycle the waste that is in Europe and we don't are not forced to, to export it and support the industry. So that. Come back on the waste point. Stefan wanted to come in and then Eva. Stefan, are they, yes. is the commission on the right track with this a sustainable products policy initiative, do you think? Well, first, uh, uh, they, they've been brave enough to, to uh, launch it, which is already being on the right track. Now, of course, the discussion is, is starting. And honestly, for example, it's not clear the status of what they call intermediary uh, product and how this will be covered. And among this intermediary product, there is still. 
So uh, there is still a lot of discussion to, to go on. But one thing I think what that could be, I would say, smart according to me is that if we set some uh, form of carbon footprint requirement for product placed on the market, then in a way we do not necessarily dictate one route or another. So to decrease your carbon footprint, you can increase the recycle content because then using recycled material will uh, have a lesser impact on climate. You can also change drastically the manufacturing process, I think a bit uh, along the line uh, set by Eva and, and, and decide that you will not use fossil fuel anymore to manufacture steel. And I think if we do not kind of impose one route, but we impose a kind of cap on the carbon footprint of steel placed on the market, and we progressively make this cap more stringent, then we can uh, kind of uh, uh, welcome different direction to, to get there. And, uh, and I think that that is for me a priority. How do we set a kind of a carbon footprinting for steel placed on, on the market? So I, I, that's, that's uh, I think, something I'd like to, to, to see discussed, and this should be a priority. Thank you and very of course much. We can... wants to come in and then Axel. So thank you, thank you, Maria, for, for and also Stefan, you, you stole my question, <laughs> this uh, intermediate uh, materials, because what, 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 what we fear is like, we do welcome the plan, it's, it's excellent, and it's really good to move from waste to, to products to, 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 to make it work in the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning instead of the end, so really, really good. But we are a little bit uh, afraid of, of, of doing a lot of, of measurements, tools, requirements, on material that hasn't done their homework. Uh, that's why we are reacting to this, saying we have done our homework. In Sweden, we have recycled steel 100 years. So we don't really need that much of help to, to increase the recycled part, in, in, at least not for, for steel. So that's why we are sort of saying, uh, and, 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 and if you do this uh, for different mm -hmm. value chains that you have pointed out, I do agree, they are the ones that need to, not blaming them, but they have to do more. And, and we are in those value chains as well, because steel is in every value chain you can imagine, even though you cannot think it. It's, it's all the global goals we are impacting, all the different materials. And but I cannot even imagine a, a, a value chain that is not having steel somewhere. Mm. So I'm a little bit worried about that. And, and also my question was, of course, what, what, what will happen with this intermediate case study? And then I want to come back on the on the hazardous and non-toxic before you leave, Maria. We're going to come back to that a little bit later, if we might. Uh, let's just. I do. I stop. Thank you. Yeah. Thank no, no. We'll come back on that. I promise later on. Uh, but Axel, you also wanted to come in on this point. <laughs> yes. Thanks a lot. Uh, I wanted to react both on uh, Maria's and uh, Stefan's uh, input and give you some numbers. Uh, and uh, globally, uh, steel is the most recycled material. 70 to 90 percent depending on the uh, region in europe uh, 88 percent of the steel scrap uh, is uh, recycled the, uh, if the steel scrap comes back to the uh, eu steel industry virtually all of it is recycled uh, so we do not need a, a carbon content um, a percentage uh, this does not help our uh, our sector um, this is rather for sectors where uh, lower <laughs> collection rates uh, are, um, are achieved. Uh, of course, there still is a little bit of improvement possible, but you also need to see that we have a growing steel market in the world and primary steel making is essential for the society in the next uh, in the next uh, 50, 60 years. Uh, so uh, in addition, we um, export 21 billion tons of steel scrap every year. We import 3 million tons. So we have a net export of 18 million tons. Why can we not say that uh, steel scrap should only be exported um, if the receiving installation or country uh, has similar climate objectives, has similar environment standards for their facilities. So we have here uh, um, 
huge unlevel playing field and we do, uh, do not uh, do the best for the uh, environment uh, if we do not care about where the steel, steel, uh, steel scrap is uh, being used uh, and uh, new materials are produced. And uh, the second one, and then I stop, <laughs> is uh, the um, a question of Stefan, on, uh, how, how do we put that with uh, the cap on, on CO2, then we don't need uh, a carbon uh, 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 scrap content. Content. Uh, I think uh, that, uh, in a, in a point, no, someone has... Something's uh, happened to your sound, I don't know. I don't know. No, uh, the, the other speakers have to unmute, they have to mute when I'm speaking. Not, 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 no, no, it's no, not that. that. It's general, I'm echoing as well, I think. But yeah. let's see. Carry on, Axel. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree with Stefan that uh, we, we can uh, put a cap on CO2 as an environment footprint approach. But first, we need to create a sustainable market for green steel. And we need a, a short transition period where we need massive su support to do that for the capital investment okay. and operational costs, for example, for high Okay. Um, something strange Great. is happening with the sound. I'm echoing as well. Uh, apologies, apologies for that. that. We will try and fix it. Fix I don't know if uh, the Crowd Tech team can send me a message. Let me know, message, let me know what is happening. Um, uh, I'm just hesitating because I realise it's very off-putting. Um, off but let's let's come back, Maria. Just, just a reaction, if you would, to those points made by Stefan Eva and Axel. Um, I'm, I'm particularly, I mean, they were touching on a number of things, but they're saying, look, we don't need... We, we are doing recycling. For us, uh, the issue here is the access uh, to the scrap in order to increase. Uh, the issues relate to um, the waste point that Axel raised. I know we're going to come back on the chemicals issue. Your reaction. So it's the barriers to them doing more that they want to address more than incentives or, or targets to do more. I apologize. I think it's my mic, the one creating the issue, so I will uh, keep it mute. And when I talk, I am okay, okay. absent. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I think uh, I already said it in, in the previous intervention. Uh, what we need to act is in mobilizing uh, the sector to also in, in, increase the capacity of recycling in, in Europe. And for that, we need to act as well on mobilizing funds and, and, and investments. And, and we have an ambitious package with the EU, uh, Next Generation EU that is going to mobilize the, the resilience and facility funds. And it, it will be a work as well with member states to direct funding uh, for this uh, recycling to happen in Europe. So as I was saying, not to be forced to export it. We are also looking into regulatory barriers that might affect uh, the circulation of waste internally. And for that, the commission is conduct conducting the review of the waste shipment regulation in order to ease uh, the process of moving uh, waste within the EU and also to look how to reduce and restrict if possible the export to third countries when there's uh, an environmental harm that can be caused. So it's not that we are not looking into this and it's not that we are not aware of that, but I think we, we need to also step out into our shoes and also look into what the recycling industry can do in order to step up the efforts to increase recycling. And for that, um, I think it, chemicals have a role to play on how to how to ensure non-toxic non cycles, but also on how to support uh, recycling infrastructure in the EU. And for that, the, the, the European funds and in the European investments will play a key role, but also investments at the national level. Thank you. I think it is your, your mic that's I'm doing it. So if you could mute, everyone else can stay open, but yeah. That solves the problem each time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's come to the chemicals point because Maria raised it and Eva, uh, you did earlier. And Aurelio said in his opening presentation, he's talking about, look, we need to be absolutely clear when we're talking about this, a clear definition of toxic. And, and just because something has a substance in it, you need to measure real risk uh, in order to get this right. Um, your, your, the comment you wanted, the point you wanted to raise on that, if you would, same question to all of you. I'll come back to Maria and then I'll take a couple of questions from Maria before she has to go and we'll continue after that. But Eva, on the chemicals point. No, for me, okay, right, I, I do it brief. Circular economy is both circular and economy. And we did talk a little bit about economy items, about the demand and, and the supply. So that, that's, it's basically covered and the price of, 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 of fossil free steel. But I will come back to the circular word. 
And the circular, yes, it's good if it's circular, but if you say that something should be toxic free, uh, if, it's, if it's too free, it means zero. <laughs> And if you put a ban saying it should be zero, I, I'm, I don't think commission thinks toxic free or non-toxic, depending on the word, it doesn't matter, that it's zero hazardous substances. I, I cannot think of that if, because if you say zero, it will be plenty of landfill. Of course, that's a consequence. If you have to phase out things because it has something that is hazardous in it without any risk, that then means landfill. So, so, and I understand you understand that, but it's a little bit uh, frightening when you don't know, we need to find a reasonable definition of toxic free or non-toxic. It's used and it sounds so good. And we don't want toxic, of course not. But we are also delivering steel that is used in the hospitals, in the bodies. We are eating with steel. So we are not toxic, but we need to find a, a, a balanced okay. uh, definition on it. So that's my question. How? To, to merge those two so we are not getting in the wrong direction and, and stop things that is already now. Mm. Uh, so a, a key issue for the upcoming chemical strategy on sustainability. Stefan, uh, your thoughts, your reaction to this conversation? Well, my, my question to the steel industry is, uh, are you sure that uh, each time you can avoid using a kind of toxic substance, you do it. Uh, uh, this is uh, really for me the question. For example, on coatings, it seems to me that we can still design for better coatings and try not to have, you know, uh, coating contaminating the steel uh, uh, streams. So uh, I know there is an issue between the industry and the NGO. For us, toxic free should still be, you know, like um, the aspirational goal. And uh, uh, I mean, this aspirational goal will mean we can evolve the definition and the stringency. But I think uh, uh, we, we cannot renounce to, to, to this is, is about the same as zero waste. When we say zero waste is aspirational, but we have to move toward designing waste out of the system if we really want to be circular. So that's the same for chemicals because there is no proper circularity if we take the risk of re-injecting uh, hazardous substances notably through uh, 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 recycling. So There was this point it, about what I, does hazardous mean, what does toxic mean, uh, the, the issue of definition here that everyone... Yeah, exactly. And I know that some people are more like hazard-based or other risk-based, and notably the metal industry has been risk-based. Uh, mm. We can understand it. But still, I think that... Um, some efforts, notably along the line of eco-design principle that has been raised initially by Aurelio, I think, uh, uh, should be made uh, so that okay. we get rid of uh, hazardous and risk of toxicity okay. as okay. far as possible. And I'm not sure that all efforts are being made, but this is a question to the steel okay. industry. So, Axel, please respond to Stefan's question, if you would. Uh, and then I'm going to come back to Maria, and then I want to take a few questions before Maria leaves us. Axel. Uh, yes, I, I just want to say that, uh, of course, there should, should be the aspiration um, to, uh, to tackle hazardous substances uh, as far as possible, uh, but it is all a, also a management uh, of or control of the risk. Uh, you need to be able to control the risk. If you cannot do that, then, of course, you, you have to find alternatives. Uh, sometimes there are no alternatives, sometimes there are. When there are alternatives, you have a second problem. Sometimes the alternatives are much more expensive uh, than uh, what we are using today. And then you need uh, first to create a level playing field, and then you can implement uh, the alternatives. Thank you very much. I totally much. agree with the level playing field. Huh? So that's why we want to set some kind of product requirement uh, for product entering the EU market, because this is the way to and it can be on chemical contents or on carbon footprinting, and ideally on both. Thank you. Uh, Maria, a response to this discussion yeah, on toxicity. Well, for me, I think uh, I always structure this in three kind of uh, strands of work, and I think they are reflected in the Circular Economy Action Plan and in the Chemical Strategy for Sustainability. Is First, we need to look at design phase. It has been mentioned, and, and the chemical strategy is very clear about supporting safe by design. So looking at the very beginning of the process where really we can act. Then I think it's very important as well to be able to pass on the information along the value chain. Um, because when, when recyclers are faced with a material, they need to understand what is in there. 
in order to extract it, to remove it, or simply inform about uh, the presence of these substances. And, and uh, for that, I think that the, the action that is uh, part as well of the Sustainable Products Initiative of exploring how to develop a product passport will also help to, to, pass, to pass on this information on the value chain. And then finally, I think innovation is key. And, and innovation can apply to alternative to some substances or uh, the contamination techniques or development of methodologies to communicate. So I, I always see this as acting on, on a regulatory process and then after on, on innovate, incentivizing uh, these changes. Thank you very much. Let's take a few questions while we've still got you. Got you. Uh, first, I'm going to take one with a raised hand. Uh, David Ablago, please turn on your mic and away you go. Uh, David. David, can you hear me? You're muted, David. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Is there we go. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry for that. Um, I think it's mainly for Axel, but it, it's... Um, so we're talking about the circular economy here, obviously, but it's been mentioned, uh, you know, the level playing field and uh, the carbon content. And, uh, you know, ob obviously aware tomorrow um, Parliament's Environment Committee will, will start on an, uh, an opinion vote on, on the carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, obviously you have to get the market conditions right for the circular economy to work. And I was just wondering how important is, does the CBAM have to be um, you know, and getting that right, and and what sort of conditions, uh, what sort of things do you, do you Axel see as important in terms of the C band? Thanks. Okay, we'll come back on that, Axel, if I might. I just want to see if there are questions uh, for uh, Maria before we do. Uh, I saw another hand which went up and has now disappeared. I'll come back to it. Uh, in a moment, if it reappears. But I have a number of written questions here uh, from Tom, simply Tom. Is the Commission effectively working on a level playing field to protect CO2 reduced steel production in the EU from more CO2 intensive imports? What's the timeline? What are the roadblocks? So linking there to David's question uh, from Carola Hermoso. Steel is already being reused for many years. The galvanizing industry regalvanize every year tons of steel in order for it to be reused and thus enlarge the lifetime of steel. Both steels from primary and secondary routes benefit from this reuse capacity. Is the Commission planning to set objectives of reusability uh, in products? And there was another one uh, specifically to you relating to um, yeah, the maintenance of steel plants. Someone, Victor Sanchez, is concerned about the maintenance of steel plants to increase the lifetime of the production facilities made by steel. Is there any regulation in Europe which takes into account and promotes refurbishment, repair of worn machines and parts in steel plants? Maria, please do pick up. Ah, I'm going to take one more before I come to you. Uh, Nikita uh, Vorobiev, uh, please unmute yourself and away you go. Um, yeah, good, good, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the chance to ask the question. Um, it's related to um, um, labeling of uh, circular products uh, or low CO2 products, as uh, Axel proposed at the beginning. Uh, do you see the prospects of that uh, labeling in the near future and uh, uh, what it could be, how, how it could be structured, uh, if I may ask? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's come back to Maria first before we lose her and then I'll come to the rest of you. Maria. Maria. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, well, on, on requirements to ensure the level playing field, I would say that the most important initiative, but not the only one, is the Sustainable Product Initiative, as, as I, I explained before. Uh, the public, consul public consultation uh, will be open in a couple of weeks, maybe three, four weeks, and uh, it will be made it will be made available to everyone to contribute. So I will really encourage the sector to, to take part in the contribution. Um, in this way, uh, we, we will take it into account. The idea is also one of the requirements and it's just mentioned by, 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 sorry, by, by <laughs> sorry, I got lost. <laughs> My reality is carbon footprint, so we will be looking into this as well uh, during the preparation of the initiative about reuse is key and it's very much part of the narrative of the circular economy and the circular economy action plan. It's the idea is to move up 
in the waste hierarchy uh, to move up from recycling towards reuse to one compared to uh, and this is the idea that we want to see maybe with the sustainability principle if we can put a somehow a, an order on which activities should come first and how to promote them and support them. Um, steel plants, uh, I would say that the legislation about applicable is the industrial emissions directive. Of course, there will be also support uh, to industri industrial symbiosis processes within the review. I think they are, the commission is is exploring how to support this, and uh, but there will be also funding opportunities to, to ensure this. Um, about remanufacturing, uh, well, uh, it, it will be supported as well if we manage to shift towards uh, circular and, and sustainable products, of course, remanufacturing, and this is key for the steel uh, sector, will, will, play, will play a key role. Um, I don't want to repeat myself, but I will say it once again. Uh, these objectives are also subject to funding and, and investment. So uh, don't be shy and, and, and try to, to apply to, to uh, European funds. And then on labeling for circular products. It's true, I didn't mention it much. Uh, the Circular Economy Action Plan looks as well on how to empower consumers. And um, how we are going to do that or how we are exploring to do it is through consumer legislation to be able to, to, to give consumers uh, information on sustainability aspect, for instance, reparability or at the point of sale, uh, but also on with producers, we are working for them to substantiate uh, green claims on the basis of the product environmental footprint methods. Uh, why? Because we need that everyone that says my product is green is saying it in the same context with the same uh, information and in the same parameters. Um, about the label, I think we, it's too early to, to say we will have a label as uh, for instance, the energy efficiency uh, labeling. But uh, whenever we have all the data available and, and the system is working properly, why not? I mean, it's a question of, of really exploring it and we are in the process of preparing all the initiatives. So. And I think I did you my did, best you to did. it. Thank you very much. Very much. <laughs> and I know you, I know you have us now. Yeah. So thank you so much. So and much. And thank, thank you for thank you with with the challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a, a fruitful discussion with the rest. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. So I'm just waiting a moment while Maria moves. There we go. Uh, apologies for those echoes. Uh, I will come back to you, Stefan, but there's a number of questions uh, um, for the industry. So let's take those as a group. There was the one, Axel, uh, from Daffid, but let me read out a few more. Another one specifically to you. You said that for green steel definition, you will start by low CO2 steel. How do you define low CO2 steel, EEAF, or below a certain threshold uh, benchmark of emissions factor? Then we have... Um, steel from Martin Laberton. Steel is not the only raw material which agreed a future strategy of less, using less CO2. Aluminium went even further, setting a concrete goal of using nearly 50% recycled material by 2050. Will steel be prepared to commit to a similar target? Uh, and from Madhu Sayihanathan, how big a role will EPDs and LCA play in influencing the sustain sustainable purchasing of steel, especially in construction? Um, and one last one for now uh, from Soyong Lee. For the high quality product, the amount of scrap usage can be limited to at best 30%. Are there any technical improvements? Axel, ever respond on those if you would, and then I'll come back to Stefan. Axel first. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I start with uh, the point on aluminium. Um, uh, we had set a target for CO2 um, for already the year 2030. We have also a target to be close to carbon neutrality by 2050, if the framework conditions are right. Uh, what, what Mr. Leverton was pointing out is that they have also a target uh, to recycle aluminium uh, by 50% in 2050. But we have already today uh, still uh, recycling in the EU of 58% today already. And that will, of course, continuously increase. So uh, we have already achieved uh, the other sector's targets for 2050 today. Yeah. Um, so um, I think we are, you see that we are quite advanced as, as an industry here. Uh, the, the second point um, was a question on how to define uh, low carbon steel. 
um, will this be EIF or will there be a benchmark? <laughs> we are currently working on that uh, because we all know that we will need for decades a primary steel uh, production. So we will have to, to reduce the CO2 footprint of the primary steel route, but also of the secondary steel route, uh, so the electric arc furnace route. Uh, and we need to find uh, now a way how to, uh, let's say, be able uh, to, to sell uh, green steel on the market uh, that has a, um, let's say, a, already a carbon neutral uh, footprint. Uh, and we are looking to, for example, when, when you uh, uh, deploy a new technology, um, and can you, the emission reductions of this new technology, can you um, convert it to a uh, respective amount of uh, CO2 free steel? And then you set, let's say, more ambitious benchmarks over the time so that you can come to a complete um, carbon neutrality in the total steel production by 2050. So that is what we are currently discussing. And of course, um, we, we will uh, also come up with a public discussion on that point, uh, but it's not that easy as you can imagine uh, to find the way, uh, the right formula. Uh, and then the, the first question was on the uh, CBAM, on yep. the carbon border adjustment. Yep. Uh, this is indeed a very important file. Uh, the problem which we have as a steel industry and also other sectors have that, uh, that um, the emissions trading uh, system sets benchmarks for installations. Uh, and these benchmarks uh, provide you with free allocation if you are at risk uh, of calm leakage. Uh, the rules say that uh, the average uh, of the 10% most efficient installations get their um, needs for CO2 certificates for free. So the average of 10% means around about five installations out of 100 should get uh, their um, allowances for free. Uh, but this is already not the case uh, anymore because the benchmarks are being updated. <clears throat> you have um, uh, indirect carbon cost compensation that is already kept to maximum 75%. Uh, the steel industry, the integrated route, primary steel making has a, an a additional problem so that even the most efficient steel plant in Europe uh, does not receive sufficient a free allocation uh, to cover all its costs. Uh, of course, when there's an economic uh, downturn, then you may spare some uh, CO2 allowances um, to use them in, uh, in future years. But if the normal economic cycle uh, would not allow you to have um, uh, additional free allocation, uh, unless you find a technology uh, okay. which is cost efficient, to reduce uh, your uh, carbon footprint. Uh, one more sentence. Uh, it is important for us as a steel industry to keep the current carbon leakage measures and add this, uh, the um, carbon border adjustment uh, for the additional costs which other sectors do not have. Okay. Uh, so that maybe we can discuss in the second uh, step in this uh, call because it's an extremely important issue for our industry. Thank you very much. Um, Eva, I want to come to you and let me add in another couple of uh, questions that are directed directly uh, at the industry. Um, Christopher Journet says the transition to more electric steel will depend a lot on scrap price levels and the costs of new EAF plants build it, built in the EU. Do you think steel makers will earn enough money to invest more in EAF plants. And from Sarah McNaughton, a lot of the discussion has been about recycling, reuse and green steel. What can the steel industry do to encourage more efficient steel use in the first place? Uh, E.g., she says, buildings are still routinely built using too much steel. Uh, I don't know whether you can pick up on those points, but also any of the others that um, Axel's already touched on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, I, I actually had some something about the reuse, but I, I, I can maybe come back to that because it's it's if you or I start with that because I think it's important to mention that, that of course we want to reuse. If we we recycle, go going back to the electric arc furnace, then then it costs quite a lot of energy. Uh, maybe it's easier to to just do something with. With the, with the steel and reuse it again, not going, I think it was Stefan's point, go, not going via the electric arc furnace, 
that's the second step. If you if you cannot make it reuse, then you have to recycle it. So I do agree to that. The problem is if you want to recycle something that is has have food in it, maybe you need to think about the health impl implications or or the safety. If you're using something from a building in another building, who is taking responsibility of the building? There is a lot of things for us. We are agreeing to, to reuse as much as we can. And also one of our Swedish steel plants is about this material efficiency. We've tried to sell as little as steel as possible, to have, have it as high strength steel that is really thin. It's really, really little steel to sell. It's really high strength steel. You can use it a lot and it is, it's, it's durable. But when we do it, we are having using more energy. Um, it takes longer time. We have to use much more energy than a, a regular one. So you have also this um, cross-media effect that you have to take into account. And also the one you were saying about coating, uh, Stefan. If you put coating on a steel, that steel will long, stay longer in the society and you don't need to take it back as soon as possible. Some of the steel is sort of lost. I mean, we will not ever take stainless, uh, the Eiffel Tower back. It will remain. We will not get it back uh, for sure if we get it back and build it. Now I put my steel hat on, it will be four Eiffel Towers. And that's, that's, that's good because that's the material efficiency. But again, we have this cost, the economy part of it, that it costs also in energy, it costs uh, in, in maybe chemicals to make it uh, durable and stay longer in the society. And this is also circular economy, to, to keep it in the loop, not taking it back and forth and clean it or recycle it. So it's, it's, it's important to have the, the full picture, I think, when we're talking about circular economy in a general sense, not only for steel, but that's, that was my comment. And, and if we have the money for electric yeah. work furnace, yes uh, or no, or maybe we, we, we try to do a completely new route that we never tried. And this is what we're doing in, in the Sweden. It's a, it's a electric arc furnace, but we are not using scrap, but we are using iron sponge instead. So it's a completely new process uh, okay. uh, route. Thank you. Based on primary. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Stefan, you wanted to come in. Please do react to what you've heard so far. And I think you had a particular point you wanted to make here. Yeah, thank you very much, Aki. A lot of things have been said. So uh, thanks all for a good question. Uh, just one thing I'd like to, to uh, really uh, stress is that when we speak about carbon border adjustment mechanism, I think at some point we speak carbon footprint. And I think uh, uh, for me, it's a bit of uh, starting with the wrong hand. If we say, let's design a carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism. If we are not able to design a proper methodology to measure carbon footprint, because then what do we compare? How can we say that a product that is imported compare fairly or not with a, a EU manufactured product? So we need to have a clear methodology to, 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 to capture this. On uh, uh, this Excel, we will really disagree. I think for the NGO side, we really need to remove free allowances under the ETS system because they create kind of barriers to more fundamental decarbonization of the steel industry and uh, a circular uh, economy. So for me, this is clearly one of the barriers that need to be removed. And of course, we can't combine both the CBAM and the free allowance system, because that will be like too easy, I'm sorry to say, for the steel industry then to perform without really creating the incentive. Um, I've got two other points I'd like yeah, to, to make. First, you. on, on uh, um, the idea, I think people, uh, uh, Maya mentioned the idea. I think we are still short in what we cover under the industrial emission directive. And when we set the uh, sector document for the, the steel, for example, why don't we really uh, uh, integrate, you know, resource efficiency and uh, I would say uh, uh, climate e e emission? I mean, they are not considered as other type of emission. You know, they are not set stringent standard on, and that could be a way. But of course, then we need to make sure that this kind of uh, uh, breath can be also reflected for imported country so that there is no kind of double standard. So on this, I'd like to hear what the industry could suggest. And finally, I also like to, to hear the, 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 the thought of the industry on, you know, when, for example, Eva or, or Axel, you say, well, but if we want to produce thinner steel, we need to use more energy, or if we want to decarbonize the process, it comes at a cost. But according to the uh, estimate I've seen, what costs a lot for the steel industry 
reflect in a very little increase in price in products, for example, in a car. So even if it's significant increase for the steel industry in terms of price for a car or price for a building, it's still neglectable. And I'd like to uh, uh, investigate with you what kind of mechanism we could have, some people call consumption charge or things like this, so that in a way you are given, you know, the right incentive to invest, you know, okay. to make the necessary, uh, 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 I would say, cost on your side, but not being then penalized because in fact, the increase in price for the final consumer or user may be a, a minimum and we could try to find mechanisms okay, to offset this. Yeah. Uh, sorry to, to bring you to halt, but if no, they thank you. Answer, we're nearly out of time here. So Axel, and can I just also add one question from our audience, Axel, the carbon footprint is related to the process route, technical level and equipment level, as well as individual differences in different steel plants. How to accurately quantify the carbon footprint is the EU steel carbon border tax imposed on specific steel mills or just for different countries? That's from an anonymous attendee, so I can't give you a name, but lots of people liked it as a question, so I'm squeezing it in. So Axel, your response to Stefan's questions and to that one, then I'll come to you, Eva, and then we'll try and draw some conclusions. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jackie. I start, uh, yes, with Stefan um, to uh, better reflect uh, the increase in, in products, um, prices. Uh, we, we made a calculation. Uh, you are completely right, Stefan, that uh, what um, the green steel will come at a cost, a uh, huge cost burn for the steel industry. But uh, when you then... Um, put the steel, the green steel in products and consumer products, uh, the costs are not so high compared to, uh, to the price of the product. Uh, we made a rough calculation for a car, which would uh, become uh, between uh, 150 to 350 euros more expensive when you use green steel. Uh, so this uh, could be acceptable for the society to, uh, to bear this burden or a washing machine uh, 1 euro 23 to uh, to 8 euros depending on how much steel you use um, so this could be acceptable for the society so we need to make sure then that we create um, a, a situation uh, for a green steel market in europe uh, if a ton of steel uh, which uh, is CO2 low, it costs 100 or 200 euros more than a conventional ton of steel, which let's say costs 500 or 600 euros. And then we need to make sure uh, that uh, um, conventional steel uh, cannot, uh, let's say, take uh, replace the steel because no one will buy a ton of steel which has the same properties, but which is 100 euros more expensive. So that is why we, uh, we need a, a transition where we get the support uh, to, uh, to the companies. We have, uh, let's stay with the integrated route, for example, we have 23 sites left in the EU, a primary steel making. If you uh, can help those uh, companies to become, uh, to produce green steel uh, by first uh, converting one installation, help them in the operational costs for a transition period and then you will create a, a market for green steel and then you can apply other measures standards co2 footprint um, based uh, co2 costs uh, but we need this 10 to 15 years transition uh, and uh, therefore uh, coming to to the first point on the cbem uh, where uh, stefan said we can absolutely not agree uh, to have both at the same time. And I want to give you an example. Very um, briefly, if you would, Axel, we're running out of time yes, now. <laughs> yes. Uh, if we, we remove, remove free allocation, uh, the steel, uh, the cost for the steel industry in Europe will increase by 50 euros per ton, ton of primary steel at a CO2 price of 25 euros. We have this cost on every single ton of steel we produce. Outside Europe, you do not have these costs. We export 20 million tons of steel. How can we compete on the export markets? Exporters to the EU export maybe five, maximum 10% of their total production to the EU. They would have, with the CBAM, these costs only on this percentage of their total okay. production. You can imagine what investors, banks, will do, how they will invest not in Europe anymore, if they see that our balance sheets are going down. 
Thank you very much, Axel. I'm sorry to bring you to a close, but I do want to finish on time and I want to put you on the spot before we finish. Eva, uh, please, uh, a reaction to any of these comments. And can I just ask you one issue to touch on? We haven't talked about it very much. Uh, Aurelio's point, he talked at the beginning about industrial synergies and that exchange of byproducts, of co-generated products from one industry to another. Um, if you could say two words about what we need to do to stimulate that better uh, as well um, in a couple of minutes. And then I'm gonna come to Stefan and the rest of you to identify some priorities, but Eva first. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, I, I was actually raising my hand when Stefan said we have to include uh, um, CO2 emissions in IED and also circular economy in IED. So let's start with the circular economy uh, first, because that's connected to your question about the industrial symbiosis. So uh, Aurelia showed a, a, a slide on not on the steel route, but on all other products that is used in other sectors. If we go to IED, IED already has a lot of contents that is circular economy. It is about resource efficiency. It's about waste minimization. It's, about, it, it's already there. The word circular economy is not in the legislation, but the work is done. And we have also bad conclusions, which is the sort of the legislation saying material efficiency, energy efficiency, water, blah, blah, blah. So there is already an element of circular economy, of course, in IED. And maybe IED is not the perfect a legislation for circular economy because why? IED is about a plant, a site, and circular economy is about interacting with others. So it's difficult to regulate a steel industry saying you must use this residue in another sector because that other sector will not be happy if we regulate the other sector in our ref. So, so this is the complication and IED is about process and plant and circular economy is basically more about products. So yes. for me, I don't think IED is the perfect place. We have to work on it in, in, the, in, of course, in the guidance and try to evolve so we do more on circular economy, but there is quite a lot already. So I don't think that's mm -hmm. the, the strongest tool. But Eva, sorry to challenge you. You know that there is no waste prevention plans or, 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 or targets or, or industry or symbiosis target in the IED to get the permits. So as opposed to other emission level where you have to respect a certain cap, there is no equivalent. So I agree with you. There are certain elements, but there are also the elements that the industry can neglect to get the permit today, as opposed to other type of emissions. So my push was, can we make sure that we consider this primarily in permitting installation okay. as other uh, emissions? So sorry. This uh, conversation will run and run. We are almost out of time. And Axel, I promised sorry. I would finish on time. You can have 30... 20 seconds, if you would, and then I have a final question for you all. Axel. Yeah. Can I continue or not? Sorry, because I was uh, not yes, on the CO2 as well. If, yes, if, I'll come back on that in a moment. Just uh, Axel, desperate to jump in on that particular point. Sorry. Uh, no, be, be, because there was one more question which I did not answer. Oh, okay, yet. we'll come back. Sorry, Eva, continue. <laughs> no, just to, start, to, to, to conclude on, on the CO2 emissions. So, if you are saying we should take out ETS uh, allowances, yep. I, I think I heard that, Stefan then you're saying that you will take it out and you will regulate it in IED instead. Is that what you're uh, proposing or, or not? Because what we really don't want clearly is double regulation. We cannot have first you buy allowances and then regulate it okay. in, in the permits. So, so we need to discuss. And I think okay. we You're have, to have to take this discussion offline because we are almost out of time. But so I will let you continue this by email or however. But Axel, you wanted to pick up on one other question. You've just muted yourself. Yeah, uh, there was a question of how uh, accurate can be the low yes. uh, carbon footprint, yeah. or is it on installation based, product based, yeah. or country based? Um, of course, this is a process. We will not be very uh, the most 100% accurate in the beginning, but the objective is to take into consideration the full carbon footprint through the value chain life cycle approach. That's very important to develop this methodology in the next 10 years or even earlier as possible. We okay. have to start with a simplified system to test it and then improve it over the years. And then the question uh, um, installation product or country base, we have a problem, uh, of course, um, if we put it uh, only installation based, the problem of source shifting 
uh, a country, let's say a country X, China or whoever, uh, it could say, I only import uh, export to the EU uh, from facilities which meet the EU standards. And uh, my dirty facilities, I export the material to yeah. other countries. So that's indeed a problem which we have to discuss. I have to address. Thank you very much. Okay, we are almost out of time and I'm very sorry because I would love to continue this discussion for much longer. Uh, but before we go, I just wanted to sort of try to identify key next steps because we've discussed, Stefan, a whole range of issues, a whole range of important things. If steel is to play the role uh, that we heard uh, that it can play in the circular economy to the full. Um, if you were the European Commissioner responsible for the Circular Economy Action Plan, and you had to do one thing, you had a day and you had to do one thing to set us on the right path to move, as the title of this event says, from proposal to reality, what for you, and it's gonna be a sentence each, what for you is the key next step? What do we need to do? So uh, I think if there were one thing I would uh, really uh, uh, accelerate is really this idea of setting a carbon footprint uh, 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 requirement and of course methodology, because I think once we have this, once we have clarified this, then we can uh, set regulatory requirement, we can set incentive, which are based on something that will create a level playing field and something comparable. So Thank that would be much. my priority. Thank you. Eva, your key priority, your key next step. Uh, to start to face the circular economy has two words. It's both circular and economy. Don't forget the market conditions, demand and supply of the certain material. Thank you. Thank you very much. So when we talk about sustainability, it's all the pillars of sustainability that are key. Axel, you have the last word. Thank you. Uh, I would um, convene uh, a meeting between the policymakers on high level, uh, the Commission President, uh, the member states, uh, to discuss a steel action concept with the employers and the unions in order to uh, evolve this green steel market in the next 10 years. We need to sit together. Germany has made the example. There is a steel action concept uh, developed and adopted by the government, uh, and they are now sitting together. So this should be done. And secondly, um, provide uh, substantial regulatory and financial support uh, to the sector for developing a sustainable market for green steel as soon as possible, and this by 2030 at the latest. And on that note, uh, the audience can't thank you in the time on a tradition. So let me do it on their behalf. Thank you for a great discussion. I wish we had another half an hour, another hour. So much to talk about. But thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to you for your questions and comments. I managed to squeeze most of them, not all of them, but most of them uh, in. And it only re and thank you also to our interpreters uh, for their sterling work. And it only remains for me to wish you an enjoyable rest of the day and stay safe. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.